Wow, you guys, you guys quieted down and went right back to your seats so well. You're, you're a, a much more obedient group than the first service, so, so well done. Had you seen it, you might have been wondering why I was racing through the mall on the busiest day of the year, chasing a guy who was much bigger than me, wearing a uniform who clearly felt like he was going somewhere important. But, but maybe the, the real first question was, why was I at the mall on Black Friday? You, you might not be surprised to know that I don't enjoy shopping on any day, uh, let alone Black Friday. But I, I love my wife, I love my daughter, and they wanted to go shopping, and our son didn't come home for Thanksgiving, so I would have been home alone, and I said, hey, I'll go with you guys. So I grabbed my tablet, said, I'll just find a place where I can sit and do some work, and you guys can do your shopping thing. And so they went, they found their stores that they go to, and I found a, a little cafe table in the middle of the mall and sat down there and was just kind of doing some work. Uh, but I discovered I actually enjoyed myself because on Black Friday, there's a lot of interesting people, right? I mean, I think you go to the mall on any day and see a lot of interesting people, but on, on Black Friday, it's a little bit crazy, and there's people running around, and they're frantic, and it, I kind of begin to think, you know, this is, this is the Christmas season now, right? Day after Thanksgiving, we're into the Christmas season. We call this the season of peace on earth. And we start it with the most chaotic day of the year. So I was sitting at my cafe table, uh, kind of people watching, kind of doing, doing my job. And, and this group of moms and daughters kind of assembled right next to me. So they were standing right next to my table, and I was working, but I could could overhear what they were saying, and they were very angry. They were very upset, and I couldn't catch all of the reasons, but they had had an experience in a store that really got them riled up. They'd gotten into a big fight, not like physical, but a big angry argument with the people in the store over the sale that was advertised versus the sale that they were given, and they didn't agree with the price they had to pay. I, I don't know all the details, but they were very, very upset. And meanwhile, right down the, the aisle, walking towards us, there was this guy pushing a cart. Now, he was the mall garbage guy. If you think about what the mall garbage guy does, it's not a great job, right? He, he has this cart, and he goes from garbage can to garbage can in the mall and, and takes the bags out, throws them in his cart, puts a new bag in. And, and probably on any day of the year, it's not a great job. But you can imagine on Black Friday that there's twice as much garbage there's all kinds of nasty garbage. So imagine the things that he's seeing and touching and smelling. And there's twice as many people that he has to navigate his big garbage cart through. But, but this guy, instead of being depressed and angry, angry and stressed out, he was having a good time. He's pushing his cart and he's like, hey, look out everybody, coming through. Heads up, look out, here I come. Just this is happy, kind of trying to give the season of joy to everyone. Now the problem was, my, my table was right here. And just a few feet away was one of those kiosks where they sell cell phones or something. And between my table and the cell phones was this, this group of angry women, right? All talking about how angry they were at the store they'd just been at. And here comes garbage guy, and right next to my table is a garbage can. So somehow garbage guy has to get to garbage can, but angry women are in the way. He's trying to be happy, lift everybody's spirits, and so he's pushing, hey, heads up, look out, need to come through, excuse me, pardon me, and they, they get out of his way, and he comes through, and he starts to do his job, he's taking the garbage out, and, and I watched as, as he's pulling the garbage out, one of the women kind of stomps up to him, and gets right in his face and says, who's your manager? And I think he was a little bit surprised by this, and he kind of turns, turns around and says, I'm sorry, excuse me? And she says, who's your manager? And he said, oh, I, I, I work for the mall administration. There's a counter right over there. Fine. And she turns and stomps and storms off. And her whole group storms off behind her. Now, I was close enough to this guy that I could actually hear him talking to himself. And he was very confused. He didn't understand what had just happened. And, and he, he, he actually, he's pulling the garbage out and he looks around and he says, what just happened? And then he, he said to himself, I, I think I was really courteous. And then he said, I'm, I'm just trying to do my job. And he wraps up the garbage, throws it in his cart, puts the new bag in, and, and he heads off. And shortly after that, Marianne and Emma came out of the store where they were, and they came over. And I said, you guys aren't going to believe what I just saw. 
And, and I started to tell them the story about the angry group of women and how they were mad at the garbage guy. And, and midway through my story, I said, hold on just a second. And I turned, and here's where we started, where I'm racing through the mall. I turned and I said, I'll be right back. And I went racing through the mall chasing this guy. See, what had happened was as I was talking to Marianne and Emma, I could see off in the distance in another part of the mall, the angry group leave the counter where the administration was and head off another direction. But as soon as they left, I saw a guy in a uniform who looked very important leave and start walking very quickly this direction past us. And he had this look on his face of, I'm really frustrated that I have to be doing this. And as I watched him walk by in that direction, which is the direction that garbage guy had gone, I'm talking to him, I said, hold on just a second. And I started chasing this guy. And I caught him. I mean, I didn't grab him or anything. I said, hey, sir, sir. I said, are you going to see the, the, the garbage guy? I don't, I don't know if I called him the garbage guy, but he said, he said, yeah, that's where I'm headed. I said, you know, is he in trouble because of that interaction he had with those women? And he said, yeah, he is. I said, can I tell you, I was right there. And, and I kind of told him the story. I said, this, this guy, he was super courteous. He was being friendly. He, he really didn't do anything wrong. And, and the, the guy said, you know, thank you for, for telling me that. He said, our, our people are so stressed today. This is the most difficult day of the year for them to work. And it seems like any little thing will set them off. They're, they're just really having a hard time. And I appreciate you telling me this so I didn't go and yell at him. And, and as I walked back to my table, I thought, you know, here we are, peace on earth, right? Goodwill towards men. And it's sorely lacking. I started to think about what I was going to say today because I knew that today I was talking about this idea of peace. And you know, peace is really lacking in a lot of places. And it's really lacking in a lot of people. And maybe you're lacking peace because you didn't get the sale you hoped you would get. Or because uh, someone at the mall mistreated you. Or, or maybe you're lacking peace for a lot of other reasons. But, but I think as we enter this season of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, there's this question of, how can my life be full of peace? And I want us to answer that question today. And so the question we're answering is, what is the secret of a peace-filled life? How can I really experience what it means to live at peace? This week, as I was thinking about the idea of peace, I was looking for some images that convey what peace is. And so I went to one of my stock photo sites and just typed in peace and and all the pictures that came up are the ones you would imagine. So there's pictures of mountains and, and trees and still lakes and all that other stuff that you would expect when you type in the word peace. But there were also pictures of people. And as I scrolled through all of the pictures, uh, one of the things I noticed was any picture of people only had one person. Now, now maybe they were like sitting on the edge of a dock looking out over a misty river. Or, or, or maybe they were standing on top of a mountain doing some yoga pose or, or, or whatever else. But every picture only had one person. And as I scrolled through, I thought to myself, you know what? Our world doesn't understand peace. We think that peace is something we look for within ourselves, right? I just need to dig a little bit deeper. I, I just need to, to meditate or fix myself. And, and if I work on myself enough, I can find peace. But this is the truth. You can never find peace internally until you're living at peace externally. And you know this is true because you've experienced it in your relationships. Maybe you have a relationship with someone that you really care about and that relationship has somehow gotten off the rails and maybe it's a spouse or a child or a parent or a friend and as long as that relationship isn't where you want it to be, you know you have no inner peace. You can't sleep at night. You're stressed. You're anxious. Or, or maybe it's something at work where you have that one person at your job that really grinds your gears. And you get home and you just can't get them out of your mind. And, and the lack of peace there is creating a lack of peace here. Or, or maybe it's someone that you love or deeply care about and, and they're going through something unexpected in their life. Maybe it's an illness or, or a tragedy or, or something else, and, and your concern for them and your fear for them keeps you from having peace. You see, our internal peace is linked to our external peace. And our external peace isn't just about other people, it's also about God. And, and many people are struggling to find peace with God. 
Maybe they can't even define it that way. But it's a sense of guilt from the past or regret. And and it keeps them from really coming to grips with who God is and, and what He expects. Or maybe it's frustration or anger at Him because your life isn't going exactly where you hoped it would go. And so you don't have peace with God. Maybe it's just a a, a lack of understanding who he is or what he expects. And it keeps you up at night wondering, what is this all about? What's coming next? You see, a lack of external peace leads to a lack of internal peace. So this morning, as we ask and hopefully answer this question, what is the secret of a peace-filled life? I hope you'll be able to get to a point where you can see how you can be at peace externally and internally. And here's the answer to the question. The secret to a peace-filled life is to live a cross-shaped life. You know, the cross is the symbol of Christianity, right? Here, here at the gathering, we have a cross on the stage, typically from Easter through Thanksgiving. Now, I want you to understand that there's nothing special or, or sacred or magical about a cross. The cross itself has no power. It's not an icon that we worship, uh, but it represents something to us. The the cross represents to us what Jesus has accomplished, what he's done for us and what he's doing in us. And, And so when we see the cross, we are reminded of what Jesus has done. And so when we think about what it means to live a cross-shaped life, and by the way, this isn't original with me. There's actually a book by that title, and, and lots of people talk about a cross-shaped life. But when I say a cross-shaped life, here's what I'm talking about. I want your life to be shaped by what Jesus did for you. I want your life to be shaped by what the cross represents. What Jesus did for you, what he's doing in you, and what he wants to do through you. That's the cross-shaped life. And to talk this through, we're going to look at the last two verses of the book of Ephesians. But before we get there, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the book. So we're going to start this morning in Ephesians chapter 1. If you have your Bible, you can turn there or pull it up on your phone or your tablet. Uh, We'll put the words up on the screen if you want to follow along that way. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul says, May God our Father... And the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So we started this six months ago, this journey through Ephesians. And we started right here with this idea of grace and peace. And we said, you can never experience peace with God until you've received grace from God. And you can never be at peace with others until you've extended grace to others. You see, the beginning of a cross-shaped life begins with receiving God's grace. God pours grace into our lives all the time. Grace is really just another word for gifts. And all of God's gifts that he gives to us are good gifts and undeserved gifts and unexpected gifts, far far bigger and better than just our football team winning a game. We see God's grace all around us all the time. Oxygen is a gift from God. Think about this. What did you do to deserve oxygen? to deserve the ability to breathe. You might say, well, I was born. Yes, but you had nothing to do with that. Other people did all the work on that one. And and, and yet, all the time, you're breathing in and breathing out. And and every time you fill your lungs with oxygen, that should be a reminder of God's undeserved grace to you because he's given you something that you didn't earn. And we could walk through nature and see over and over again how much God has given to us that we haven't earned. Uh, Water, snow, sunrise, rainbows, unicorns, well, maybe not unicorns, but everything that we see that is good in our world is a gift from God. It's his grace to us that that we haven't earned, that we don't deserve, but because he loves us, he showers us with his grace. And for those of us who follow him, who are his daughters and his sons, that grace goes even further. Let me quickly point out to you three things that grace does for you. Grace saves you. Right? Grace, grace saves us. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 that by grace are we saved through faith, not by works. You see, our salvation is not something that we've earned. It's not something that we deserve. It's something that God has given to us. He's saved us from ourselves. He's saved us from our sin, from our mistakes, from our past, 
from the guilt and the shame that we should have. He saved us from that, and he saved us to a bright new future full of hope and joy and peace and love. And he's done all of that because he, he loves us, because he wants to shower his grace on us. So this morning, hear this. If you're not at peace this morning, and you're not at peace with God this morning, perhaps the reason is because you've never started here and received his grace. God offers you this brand new life, far better than the life you've lived. And if you truly want to experience his grace, there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to force him to give it to you. You simply have to accept the gift you simply say, God, I'm giving you my old life, the one that doesn't work, and in return I'm receiving this new life that you have for me. That's what it means to be saved. That's what God's grace does for us. It saves us. It goes further than that, though. God's grace also sustains us. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul wrote that his grace is sufficient for me because in my weaknesses he's made strong. You see, what Paul was saying was no matter where I am in life, God gives me exactly what I need. So whether I'm at at the top of the mountain or the bottom of the valley, God gives me what I need. Whether I'm in the bright light or the darkest night, God gives me what I need. That's why in Psalm 23, David wrote, he walks with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Not into, and then leaves me there, but he walks through because he knows what I need to come out on the other side. And, And sometimes God's sustaining grace might come in the form of a person who comes into my life to encourage me. Sometimes it may come in the form of provision that was unexpected but turns out to be exactly what I needed. Sometimes it might be just an experience that lifts my spirits or perhaps he grants me an extra helping of patience so I can make it through to the next chapter. But God's grace sustains us because God always gives us exactly what we need. Not what we want, not always what we ask for, Not in our timing, but always what we need. That's his grace. God's grace saves me. God's grace sustains me. And God's grace strengthens us. Remember when we were in Ephesians 4, we talked about the gifts that God has given to all of us. You see, he's made each of us unique and different. And we all have something different to contribute to his community. And it's when all of us take all of our gifts and work together and use those gifts that we build ourselves, we build each other, and we build God's kingdom. And your life is full of the gifts that God has given you. Not just the talents and abilities you have, but but also your experiences, your past, your passion, your personality, your possessions. All of those are gifts from God. The people in your life, the perspective that you've gained, those are gifts from God. And when we all use those gifts, we are able to accomplish what he created us to do. You see, God has already given you everything you need to accomplish what he made you to do. God's grace saves us, God's grace sustains us, and God's grace strengthens us. And when we've received that grace, how do we respond? The only way to respond to God's grace is to love God's Son. Let's let's jump to the end of Ephesians, all right? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23. Paul writes this. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is saying, look, you've got this vertical relationship with God. This is what it looks like. God pours his grace out on you, and in response... You love Christ. You love Jesus. Now, now how do we demonstrate our love for someone? We, we may do it through time. And we ought to spend time with Jesus. We ought to pursue him to try to learn about him, to try to know who he is. Uh, sometimes it's through being devoted to him. And our lives ought to be devoted to following Jesus. Sometimes it's because we talk well about them to others and we ought to talk well about Jesus to others. But if we really want to know how to love Jesus, we should listen to Jesus. Because Jesus told us how to love him. In John 15, Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he's with his disciples for the last time. And this is what he says to them, John 15, 9. He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. 
remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So Jesus is saying, if you truly want to love me, obey me. And if I really want to obey Jesus, I need to know him. I need to know what his commands are. And so my life ought to be dedicated to getting into his word, understanding what it says, and then finding out how to align my life with what he has said. And I can do this every day. I I, I can sit down for five minutes or ten minutes or fifteen minutes or half an hour and, and read God's word and see Jesus' commands and ask myself a simple question, what's my next step? How can I more closely align myself with the life of Jesus? And and I can do this every day for the rest of my life because there is so much there. There is so much depth. There is so much wisdom. There is so much grace. There is so much understanding that my life can be full of it every day for the rest of my life. But but for this morning, let me just give you the basics, all right? Because this is what Jesus said. The greatest commandment is love God, and the second one is really similar, love others. So if you want to obey Jesus, if you want to love Jesus, here's how you do it. You love God and you love the people around you. That's it. And that, that kind of moves us to part three of a cross-shaped life because it starts with God's grace to us and in response, we love Jesus. And if we love Jesus, we obey him, which means we love others, which means we extend grace to others. You see, if you've received grace, you ought to extend grace. And if grace is a gift, and God has poured his grace or his gifts into you, then you ought to consider yourself to be a gift from God to the world. That's right, I just said it. You're God's gift to the world. And you are. See, the way you live ought to demonstrate to everyone around you how much God loves them. That's what it means to demonstrate grace, to allow God to work through you to give a gift to his people. As I was thinking about this this week, I actually made a list about what it looks like to be gracious. Um, So I'm going to read this list because it's 10 different items. Uh, If you want to get a copy of it, you can look in the YouVersion app and it's there, or you can write me a note on your connection card. I'll send it to you. But just, just listen along here. Here's 10 ways that I think we can be gracious in the way we live our lives. Being gracious means allowing others to not be perfect. Being gracious means seeking opportunities to be generous. Being gracious means celebrating the transformative work of the Spirit in the lives of others. Being gracious means being present and offering support even when it may be costly for me. Being gracious means choosing to see potential rather than shortcomings. Being gracious means means hoping the best for others. Being gracious means being slow to believe the worst about others. Being gracious means using my words to build up rather than tear down. Being gracious means releasing my right to revenge and embracing the freedom of forgiveness. And being gracious means choosing to see others as someone for whom Jesus was willing to die. Now, now hear this. This leads us right into part four of a cross-shaped life because if I'm living this kind of a gracious life, what that means is I'm going to find peace with others. That's the fourth part, is extending peace to others. Think about it this way. If I live this kind of gracious life, is it more or less likely that I'll be living at peace with other people? Or or, or if you need to do it the other way around, if people extended you this kind of grace, is it more or less likely that you live at peace with them? And, And if you're living at peace with more people, is it more or less likely that you'll find peace internally as well? You see, the secret to a peace filled life is to live a cross shaped life. As I receive God's grace poured out on me, in return I extend my love to Jesus by obeying him, and that means I love others and show grace to them. I'll find myself living at peace 
with others. And when I'm at peace externally, I can be at peace internally. The cross has two lines. There's a vertical line, and there's a horizontal line. Our vertical relationship impacts our horizontal relationships. And our horizontal relationships impacts our vertical relationships. And nowhere do we see that more clearly than on the Sundays we come to the table. Jesus said to his disciples, until we see each other again, I want you to continue to do this together, to remember me through communion. And it's easy to think of communion as, as something that's all about our vertical relationship, right? Because we're remembering Jesus. And we're remembering his, his death and his resurrection on our behalf. And so we think of his grace and his mercy poured out on us. But there's also a horizontal element. Because we do this together. This is not something that Jesus told us to do on our own. He said, do this together because we need to remember as I step to the table and I take the bread and I take the wine and I remember what Jesus did for me, that Jesus did the same thing for the person next to me. And Jesus did the same thing for the person across the auditorium from me. And Jesus did the same thing for my cousin, for my brother, for my husband, for my wife. Jesus did the same thing for my co-worker. Do you see that when I truly understand what it is that Jesus has done for me, it can't help but impact my relationships with others. And when I come to be at peace with God, I'll be at peace with others. And then I'll be at peace with myself. And so in just a minute, we're going to come to the table and remind ourselves what Jesus did for us and how that compels us to live at peace with others. I'm going to pray and then after I pray, the band will begin to play some music. And as they're playing, you're invited to come to the table. And here at the gathering, we celebrate what we call open communion. And that means that we don't decide who gets to celebrate with us. Uh, that is between you and God. And, and so if, if you're a follower of Jesus and you have a relationship with him and you want to be part of this this morning, then you are, are welcome to join us at the table. While the band is playing uh, you can just line up and come to the table, take one of the little crackers which represents the bread and a cup of the juice and go back to your seat. And then once everyone's been served, uh, I'll come back up and together uh, we will remember what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and, and the many gifts that you pour out on us every day. We thank you the most for the great gift of Jesus and, and that his death makes us new. And this morning as we remember that, remind us that the new life is a life invested in others. Thank you that we can remember this and use this time to look forward to the hope that you have for us. In your name, amen.